Welcome to the Oral History of the University of Laverne, a documentary series prepared by the students and faculty of Honors 304-351 during the university's 125th anniversary year, 2016-2017. I'm Al Clark, one of the faculty in the course, and I created this episode, one that discusses the closing years of the presidency of Leland Newcomer, 1968 to 1975, and the transition to the presidency of Armin Serafian, 1975 to 1985. It also touches upon two high points of the 1970s, Laverne's NAIA National Baseball Championship in 1972 and the founding of the Communications Department in 1975. A nationally recognized innovator in public schools and at Laverne College, Dr. Leela Newcomer also had a reputation for in initiating dramatic change and then moving on to new challenges in other educational settings. I strongly recommend people move from major executive positions every five to seven years. Oh. Uh, and um, I, uh, because I think their productivity does go down. But I always leave. I need new, 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 new theaters, new stages to work on. Newcomer left Laverne in 1975 with nearly as much fanfare and uncertainty as when he came in 1968. The college that he left behind had been changed fundamentally and forever, but the financial situation he willed his successor, Armin Serafian, was, if anything, shakier than he himself had inherited. The off-campus program developed under newcomers' leadership brought in more money than it spent, but a problem program for military members faced a large repayment to the U.S. government, and the iconic tents left the college in debt. The exact causes of the financial difficulties facing the college in the 1970s are still debated, and they no doubt were many faceted, but their effects were felt by all. What's the main problem of the small, private, liberal arts college? Well, I'm sure the main problem, you know, somebody would say is money. <clears throat> See, I think money is a means and not an end, so, so I look beyond money. Harold was a very careful manager, and, and I guess I would liken my administration most closely with his in the sense that we were both pretty methodical and pretty conservative right. financially. And, and Lee actually was, was a good money manager, too. We got into a couple of programs that potentially could have cost us money because the government decided we weren't charging correctly and we had a potential action hanging over our head for, I think, $600,000 at the time Lee left the presidency. Mm. And Armin inherited that. See, I didn't see that fiscal finance. Uh, I, I think that uh, Armin uh, came in and he needed something to work on, and I think they really hit on the, the financial uh, uh, aspect of it. I really don't, I didn't see that as, as such a problem. They were, they were concerned about the indebtedness with the tent. You see, they had loans on that, and they felt they had to pay those loans off. Uh, you know, uh, nobody's ever foreclosed on a college. <laughs> Some of the ways that newcomers spent the money <laughs> is, is what caused the big furor when, <clears throat> when we got the, the bill from the government. Uh, we got a letter saying, please remit That's some huge sum of money that yeah. we didn't even have a chance of, of paying um, for overcharging for the students that hadn't graduated from high school yet. Um. And so we had a program where you could take the same course over and over and over again. Oh. And they said, to, till, you, till you passed it. Huh? And they said, you can't count that. And so what we had thought they had approved, apparently they hadn't or they rethought it. Uh. So we got this check, this bill saying, you know, you need to reimburse us for this amount because we've decided that that isn't legitimate. And... Uh, so that's when Armand came in because he had some friends who had some money that could allow us to at least fight it. And, and he also had some friends that were instrumental uh, with 
dealing with government officials. Mm. And so they, they kept us from going under wow. right there. So, so that I give, excuse me, Armin a lot of credit for. He, he was not an organizer, however. And uh, that, that was, excuse me, that was kind of a bad time. Oh, oh there's no question that, that he did a lot of positive things. Um, other than just save the institution, which I rather important. Go back to 1975. Times were hard because when I was hired, we had a very, we were going through a very great financial crisis at the university. There were years uh, that we didn't get a raise. There was a wage freeze for I think three or four. Years. The the buildings were in shambles, literally in shambles. Um, I remember having to tape carpeting down with duct tape, mm. but but the attitude on campus was one of unity. Seraphion really prevented the university from going bankrupt oh, really? and closing. Yeah. It, those were difficult times for the university in terms of uh, financial financial condition. He brought the Armenian college at that time, mm. so we got some money from there. We had financial problems in the 70s, and we had them in the 80s, and it, it didn't start out this way, but part of the impetus for starting the Armenian College and keeping it going was that the Armenians were bankrolling the uh, Laverne College proper. So I hear about uh, people getting paychecks and rushing to the bank to cash them and so on, but I saw behind the scenes that my uncle was actually uh, securing those funds with Armenian loans. So there was quite a bit of back and forth with the Armenians uh, in that time to uh, keep the college going. Lee Newcomer basically uh, changed uh, the whole uh, tenor of the university with School of Continuing Education and so yeah. forth, which, which saved it. And then he leaves and it's about to close and, and Armin Serafian has to save it again. What happened? Well, it was... I think he, new, newcomer, what happened, he, he started the process, uh -huh. but it was on a very small scale. He changed it from that 400 students sort of a thing that we had, uh -huh. and so forth. Started moving it, but things were slow at uh -huh. that time, uh -huh. and so forth. And things were not good, there was a lot of competition and all that kind of thing. Schools were going out of business, that was the time that Upland went bankrupt. Right, and right. And they closed and also. Right. And the one was on the list, we, everybody was saying, we were, Concern. Yeah. People would run when they, to the to the to the bank when they got their paycheck. They would line up on Friday end of the month to get their paycheck yeah. to run to the bank to cash it to see to, to to be sure that their money will not their check won't bounce yeah. and so forth. But 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 the checks never bounce. Armin Sarafian maintained the status quo. Mm. It did not go bankrupt, mm. and I think that we need to give credit. And I give a lot of credit. I respect Serafian a lot. If it wasn't because of Serafian, it would have gone under. There was no question about it. I mean, the publishers would not send us the book. They wanted the money up front. That was in almost everything. We could not get it. We had to have the money up front before we could get anything. Wow. And, and so, so we never failed. We, we, he, they managed it. We kept it. The um, college, the university was in bad financial straits when I was there. Yeah. I, I'm so grateful for all the work that's happened since then. So, so my alma mater is this strong, healthy place. Because when I was there, I think uh, the story we students would hear was that Mary Lefetro was having to bankroll a lot of things and um, you know, come up with money to, to, to meet financial needs. And the school went on academic probation while I was a student. And that, that's hard to be paying out money and have a college that's on academic probation. The bookstore was, a, getting our books was a mess. <laughs> it was horrible. Uh, I remember he'd say, uh, we have $1,500 for, for uh, faculty salaries increase. That's a oh. whole faculty. And I had a bill in my pocket. It just happened to be $1,500 for my son's braces. Ernie and Al and I were all teaching four classes a semester. I think Al was teaching five, and they, he didn't have lab, of course, but Ernie and I did, and we taught all our labs, too. And so once in a while we'd get an assistant, but 
Uh, we didn't even have money for that. So I remember one year my entire stock budget for equipment and supplies and everything was three hundred dollars a year. It, it was it was really sparse. I had a big fundraiser one year to build the Half Moon Stadium that went around uh, yes. from uh, third base to first base, and um, um, and so that was the ballpark we had. And a lot of it I constructed uh, myself. But Deke Ken and I and some players and. And, and fathers uh, built the dugouts. Frank Johnson and I, who was the mayor of Laverne, uh, with the uh, kind of co-opted in a, uh, getting um, the uh, lights at Laverne. We got the poles and we we put the lights on the pole before they put them up, and then we had a guy come in and we dug trenches with a big trencher. We had a big box over by the third base dugout which uh, carried all the electricity, a big thing where you turn the lights on and uh, a lock to the panel. But from there we had big trenches that went out and went to all the poles. He and I wired that up and uh, Mylon Ruppel, uh, Mylon Ruppel who uh, became a um, part of Laverne baseball and that he was our equipment guy and he took care of everything. He traveled with us with his own car. Rupel and I and Frank Johnson did a ton of work on the lights. We wired them all up while they were laying down and then the wires ran down the pole and then into, a, uh, into the conduits and we built uh, the lights that uh, went on the field there. As demonstrated equally by Dr. Neer's Natural Science Division and Coach Heinz's baseball program, Laverne's financial challenges often seem to stimulate as much community spirit and volunteer service as they provoked complaints and protests. The outburst of spirit led Laverne to excel in selected areas. Baseball, for example, under Ben Hines' leadership, earned national recognition. Ben served on the staff of the University of Laverne from 1960 to 1980. He taught courses here and coached the baseball team. In 1985, he published a book called The Swings the Thing. During the last 13 years as coach at the University of Laverne, Ben Hines' teams won 561 games and lost only 283 games. In 1972, the University of Laverne was the NAIA national champion team. In 1976, we were second place nationally under Ben Hines' leadership. 1974, 75, and 1977, we took third place in the national playoffs. We won eight out of nine SkyAC championships, placed second in the other one. Forty-four of Ben Hines' players have signed with Major League Baseball teams. Fifteen players have been selected as All-Americans. Uh, Dan Quisenberry of the Kansas City Royals, who the Rolades uh, relief pitcher of the year in the American League for about three or four years in a row. Nick Leva, who is now a coach, the, the new the new manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, Danny Graham, who was a star with both uh, Baltimore and Minnesota Twins, Jack Maloof, who is now the hitting instructor with the San Diego Padres, Dave Kripe uh, in the Houston Astro organization, who is was manager of the year uh, a couple years in the minor leagues, John Verhoeven, who pitched in the big leagues with the California Angels and who's running a Grand Slam in Santa Ana now, I, Jim Lentine, who was a star with the Cardinals. University of Laverne. Board of Trustees, Alumni Association, and the Athletic Department, along with the Laverne Athletic Associates, honor Ben Hines, 1958, by proudly announcing the naming of the ULB baseball facility, Ben Hines Field, one year from today on homecoming of 1989. While Ben Hines thrilled Laverne's baseball fans under the presidencies both of Leela Newcomer and Armin Serafian, the latter, who took over Laverne's administration in 1975, pressed a comprehensive new program at Laverne, Communications. He championed 
communications because he said at PCC this is what we did. 1975 I was introduced to Esther Davis, my uncle Armin I had just become the president and he believed in uh, um, communications and he wanted to start a communications program here. He was a leader at that time in using television to send lectures out to audiences, that student audiences that weren't immediately in the uh, at the colleges. He brought Esther Davis here who was an educator in some of the junior colleges. At that time the junior colleges were the main place where journalism and communications was taking place. The state colleges had not embraced it. They had very strong programs at Pasadena City College and at Van Nuys. And so he started a journalism program, TV program, radio program, and of course that wasn't very popular. Uh. So the program started from a journalism background, and uh, the president of the university, and this was all before my time, hired a couple of his cronies from uh, Pasadena City College. And they had a background in journalism and speech, and that was the foundation of the program. Um, Esther Davis was a great asset because Esther Davis knew people in the media, mm. NBC for example. She knew a lot of people in NBC. Mm. In 75, I was the first person in journalism with Esther Davis. I majored in journalism and in music, and to this day I still play the trumpet, and I, of course, became a journalism teacher. And then Esther opened up the communications department in stages. She started with journalism. She started the whole program during the January interterm. We invigorated the Campus Times, and I think it's a misnomer to say that the uh, Campus Times and the communications started with Esther Davis. There was a Campus Times here. There was a communications department here at various times. It wasn't stable. It came and disappeared. But some of these individuals who were in the 40s had a very strong, enviable Campus Times going. It was the yearbooks, when you look back at the Orange Blossom and the Lambda and so on, they were very impressive. And I just don't even know how they did it to this day without computers. Those are impressive books, and they're very much uh, uh, historical records of the college. But Esther brought it into the modern age, and so the 1975 start started with a January interterm where we laid out a Campus Times, and uh, then we published it at the end of the January interterm. It was a poignant Campus Times because one of the lead stories was of a, a Davis family member who lost his life in an airplane crash in Colorado. So the Campus Times started then and it was a weekly publication. It was uh, published on full-size broadsheet. Then Esther uh, opened up the magazine the next January in her term in 19... 76. We did the magazine during it, January. I was not the editor of the Campus Times. I was the managing editor of the Campus Times. The first editor of the Campus Times was a fellow named Steve Simmons. But I was the editor at that same time of the magazine. So we, we worked pretty hard as students, working on several, a couple publications at the same time. The first magazine came out at the end of that spring semester. She actually taught us how to do a magazine during the interterm, and guest speakers. Esther believed in guest speakers. Uh -huh. She wasn't trained as a journalist herself. She was trained as an educator, but she had many friends, and she believed in reaching to the highest level. So we had a constant parade of LA Times individuals, very influential people who f found Laverne and said, I didn't know this college was here, and they drove out, and, and they gave us guest seminars. And so the magazine started in 76 and continues to this day. It started as a city magazine. We never wanted the formula to be a duplicate of the alumni magazine we have. Instead, as a city magazine, we could write any type of story we wanted. We could write about restaurants. We could write about sports. We could write uh, about the city politics. We could write about the college. We could write about where to get your car fixed. Uh -huh. The magazines allowed us to dip into all the genres of different magazines. It made it a, a nice uh, mix for our students to learn to write different topics. Somehow we made it to the present day, some 40 plus years later. Gary Colby was part of the start. I was the first editor, but my first advisor was Gary Colby. And then uh, subsequently the next January, Esther opened up a, a radio program. I came to Laverne, Al, back in 1976. My anniversary date is July 1st, 1976. Uh... And 
and uh, I will be celebrating my 40th anniversary at Laverne uh, this July 1st. Uh, and so here's the, the quick story, the short story on how I got to Laverne. I was actually a student at Pasadena City College oh. when Dr. Armin Serafian was still president. He had just been chosen president of Laverne College. Uh, I had an opportunity to be a uh, peer counselor and to work in their counseling center at Pasadena oh, City Pasadena. College uh. and had a lot of opportunities to interact with administrative staff. So I had an opportunity to get involved in discussions, uh, to volunteer for different programs, uh, and I happened to get to know Dr. Serafian quite well. Dr. Serafian was uh, at that time hoping to start a communications department. Mm. And so he hired Dr. Esther Davis. So at the time, she was handpicking folks to uh, come to the University of Laverne, uh, Laverne College, and I was one of those individuals that's, that was recommended to her. They, I was also interested in continuing my education. Uh, the recommendation was made to hire me. I came in as a classified staff person, uh, title of a radio specialist, when in truth, I uh, didn't even understand what that meant. So I was 19 years old, and uh, got a chance to be in in that first opportunity of when the radio develop the radio department was uh, in the process of being developed and built. Wow. Not only the program developed, but actually physically putting together uh, the radio station. I learned on the job. I was learning radio techniques. I was in charge of the first music library. I actually was one who actually used a ratchet wrench to tighten bolts as I was creating and helping to build uh, the radio station. Eventually, we also picked up during that time a professional radio station that was KBOB. It was oh. called KBOB. It was a professional radio station that was on the AM as well as uh, the FM and we negotiated a contract with the owner of the radio station. Uh, our students could use that as a lab Oh. and actually broadcast big band music, middle-of-the-road type of music were the format. But we would, our students would put together the uh, professional commercials for it, would actually act as DJs for it, and it had definitely a following out there, and it was a professional station. And then it followed that she opened up television. And so she used those January interterms to open up these different areas, and the last one to open up was television. We also then made a decision to have a TV department. I became a radio and television special. Uh, Armin Serafian, in his wisdom, knew that video or television was an important component and bought a very expensive camera at that time, a professional camera and an edit system. Mm -hmm. We bought a $40,000 camera. So pretty much from near the beginning, video, television was a component of the program. Mm. So we had a television department back then, and that's when we added an additional winger, it was called winger, unit to the back area of the student center, right across from the health module, the okay. health center. No, that no, no, no. was where we had actually a television studio, and we also had two winger offices that were there, and Sara LaRiviere and Mike Laponis, uh, Roy Linnell, Gary Johnson, all part of the radio and television staff that uh, existed back then. When then the, the people that were there became accepted mm -hmm. and uh, it was a legitimate, a legitimate uh, department. Its first home was in the, in the student center. You had journalism, you had photography, you had radio, and you had television. And then out of photography rose the Laverne magazines to have uh, the yearbook. That was all of communications there. You were yearbook editor in 1974 before the communications department started. How was the right. year, yearbook run then? Dolly Sloan was the advisor, but Dolly was an absent advisor. There was a photography teacher here, but he had nothing to do with the yearbook. His name was Tom Davis. So I, I learned by doing. I had some good people around me, and we put together a yearbook. We failed our way to success on it, a project by ourselves. My sophomore year, 
I was the editor of the Lambda, which was a yearbook that we used to have every year. This was the final Lambda issue that we did. So I'm down here on the wall. Actually, I'm on this side. Okay. So all of us who were editors of the Campus Times or Lambda um, made it to the wall. And this wall, it dates back many, many generations. Lambda editor, 1986-1987. We put a lot into it. And uh, Gary Colby was the advisor, and um, I was a sophomore at the time. And we had great, uh, great writers, great photographers, and we were able to put together a really nice history of the school during that time. It was a historical documentation piece. It was a way to capture that period of time, mm -hmm. that year of our lives, and um, everything from our events and our clubs and our friendships and our professors and all the relationships. And we really strive to capture that here and it, it, it worked. And the yearbooks, when you look back at the Orange Blossom and the Lambda, those are impressive books and mm. they're very much uh, uh, historical records of the college. We miss that in the present day. We don't have the historical records of our students through those yearbooks. The vision that I think Dr. Serafian that was being carried out through Dr. Davis was to formulize the program of a communications department and not just as an extracurricular activity. So truly make it a formal process in terms of uh, getting it into the catalog and having, uh, you know, radio classes. My master's is in communication. I was probably one of the last master students in communication. And one of the other things that makes the Laburn program different from some other programs is rather than have uh, these television productions and the radio station and the newspaper and magazine be extracurricular activities. They're integrated into the program as classes. And this is the way that Esther Davis, the founder of the department, felt that production should be taught. And I think it makes for a much richer experience for the students, but it also makes for much more work for the faculty members. I'd like to give a special thanks for help in preparing the series and oral history of the University of Laverne to my colleagues Brian Best, the Assistant Director of Educational Technology, to Ben Jenkins, the Assistant Professor and Archivist, to the late William Neal of Lordsburg Productions, and to Don Pollock, Professor of Communications, and also to all the many people who sat for oral histories uh, in this preparation for this series. Secondly, I'd like to thank the Wilson Library and Archives and Special Collections for several digital materials, most particularly the one on Lee Newcomer, prepared by Bill Neal, the one on Lee Newcomer, prepared by Don Pollock, uh, and the one on uh, Ben Hines, prepared by Bill Neal. I'd like to give a special thanks to all those whose interviews were quoted in this particular segment of the series, uh, including Susan Boyer, Loretto Damante, John Gingrich, Ben Hines, Amadis Bahani, George Keeler, Ruby Montano Cordova, Steve Morgan, Robert Neer, Nancy Newman, Don Pollock, and William Ralph. I'd also like to acknowledge that illustrations for this documentary were taken from Herbert Hogan's and Gladys Muir's Centennial History of the University, as well as from several Lambda yearbooks. I'd, finally, I'd like to wish the University of Laverne a happy 125th anniversary.